Hello everyone and welcome back to Incredible Crisis! Getting back on track kind of chronologically, we have to take a step back and look at the second half of Ririka's second chapter because, well, Taneo and Ririka's cutscenes of them talking to each other difficult to actually kind of come together like that. Yes. But... Now it is time to make contact with the mothership that Taneo was trying to protect. And how do we do that? By playing Simon Says. Honestly, why not? So what kind of what makes this difficult? Well, there are a couple ways that this makes difficult, because the way that you input is through the different face buttons, but you have to be familiar with what color each face button corresponds to. So that would be X for, uh, blue for X, circle, or red for circle, pink for square, and green for triangle. Because that mothership is always going to be spinning, so that means your orientation with the face buttons on a PlayStation controller needs to be better than what it might be. The other thing that makes this minigame a little bit more difficult is that it keeps distracting you with weird things on the Jumbotron. So when it gets a little bit more difficult into the five inputs, depending on how hard they actually want to make them, because somehow this run has been really easy, except there where it decides to do two inputs really quickly. But it really tests your short memory, short-term memory, really quick, really fast. So if you're not up for that, I, ex I recommend having a notepad and actually taking notes. It's something you can still do with video games, like there's nothing wrong with that, if it's gonna help you. I gotta please wait. Like, why are there so many weird technical difficulties with this Jumbotron? Like, bleh. Bird, go away. And news reporter, actually say something instead of cycling through pictures. Or maybe he's taking notes like I am. I don't know. They also give you tons of time in order to actually get the right combination. So the minigame isn't really that bad. So since this is the English version, we only get graded for the ignorant encounters, but we can also see the grade down below in the corner for the uh, karaoke minigame, if you wish. Pretty easy to get an A on both, as long as you don't make no, make no mistakes on the Simon Says game. Now this was, would be where I would normally say that we would go and I would make a new video for this. I'm deciding not to do that this time, instead we're going to go straight on into the next chapter.
What have you done again? Because guess what? It's the same minigame again. Um, technically this is... I'm just gonna say this right now, this is the third time you play this minigame. Um, in chronological order, this is the second time you play this game, because a certain event is gonna happen which actually makes the second time make sense. But, yeah, it, it's it's the same, this time except with Rerika. Where does the umbrella even come from? Does it come from the, the boat guy? Why didn't the boat guy get the thing fixed, like, immediately after dropping off Taneo? Because technically this happens after Taneo's stuff, which is why I did his stuff first before doing Rurika. You'll see why in, in due time. But pretty much everything is the same. Except I believe that they throw the items in different intervals. Also, for some reason, there is two different ways that each of the people who play this minigame throw out their umbrella. Either standing up or sitting down, and, I, and it depends, oddly enough, on their... on their orientation of whether or not they're grabbing water or throwing it away. Because... most of the time it actually works that way. Why I say it's odd is sometimes it doesn't. Which makes it a little bit harder in order to get back into the swing of filling up your bucket. Because sitting down and filling bucket and then throwing up your umbrella and waiting actually makes your bucket drain. It, for a good amount. Like, come on, Rerika. Like, can you not have the bucket, like, sit upright? It has a handle and everything. Like, honestly, this is one of those minigames that is done so much, and honestly is way too long for its own good. But luckily it's with music from Tokyo Sky Paradise Orchestra, which helps me get by, really. Of course, I had the same thing happen to me with Taneo. Right at the very end, I kind of get a little bit hit a little bit too much. The lady is still here. This is technically the final minigame of the game. But weirdly chronologically, there's a lot more other there's a lot of other stuff going on while before or after this point. At least how I put it. The difficulty of this minigame though is um the controls. Yeah. If you can, as you can see here, it's press X and triangle alternately in order to make the bike go. I don't care what kind of orientation you have in order to make it so that it's easier for you. It, it, this is gonna hurt a whole lot. And if you hit that crane or get hit by the ball on the crane once you're done, and you get to start over. And it's a good 2,000 meters until you actually finish this minigame. That doesn't even begin to the fact that apparently this giant mechanical monstrosity has five cannons apparently, like, hastily put into it that throw off just... And, ugh. and if you get hit, like, multiple times, then you're also screwed. This minigame honestly hurts. Like, it's great that it's awesome that it's actually the last minigame and you don't have to do anything after this when you're playing it normally. But man, like, 
hitting the X and triangle buttons, or, or even still the square and circle buttons, because I've seen other games do that kind of combination as well, pushing both of them alternately is just a weird and awkward way of putting in some sort of input, because there's no easy way of doing it. You're going to be just like weirdly shaking your hand and your wrist is going to hurt by the end of this. I'm sure of it. It's pretty unnatural. The music suits the mood, though. Come on. Come on. No. 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 You gotta press those buttons like a madman in order to make it go. Please. It also take... Like... There were some also really good cannons in there, too. Like, they fire a good length before they explode. The fact that the explosions, well, I guess the limitation was the explosions wait for you in order to catch up to the, where the cannonballs land. And how, how fast literally is Rurika pedaling? Because, honestly, the crane could run over, but I guess we're going like 80 miles an hour. Enough to fly, apparently. To the power of the little alien robot in E.T., the robot finally goes home, and Rurika is also home. Two Bs equal an A+. Okay, fine. I guess they're really not expecting you to get A's on those if they're gonna just give the highest mark to Bs. Then again, we met expectations according to where I am. But that is it for Rurika. We're down to two family members left. Etsuko and Tsuyoshi. Who's next? We'll see what's next next time. And so we come to our last highlighted artist collaboration. Prominent pianist and jazz composer Hiromi Uehara, known professionally as Hiromi. She has worked everywhere from small areas such as jingle writing for Japanese companies to performing with the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra when she was 14. She expanded her education by enrolling at Berklee College of Music in Boston, of all places, and has formed great relationships with other musicians by forming various bands. Other than known as Hiromi, she has also been connected by other names, such as Hiromi Sonic Bloom, which consists of Hiromi herself, bassist and fellow Berkeley alumni Tony Gray, drummer Martin Valhora, and guitarist David Fusinski. Removing David, the three have also been known as the Trio Project. Both groups, the Trio Project and Sonic Bloom, have had members substitute when they're not available, which include bassist Anthony Jackson, drummer Simon Phillips, and guitarist John Shannon. Hiromi Sonic Bloom seemed to have ended after two albums in 2008, but the trio project is still going strong with their album Alive in 2014, with a new album Spark coming sometime in 2016. Hiromi also tours constantly globally, having a block of New York shows in late July 2016 and shows in Singapore, Jakarta, Japan, and China in August through mid-September. Hiromi appeared on Tokyo Scott Paradise Orchestra's mini-album Goldfingers in 2010, with their strong-sounding song Sui Kinkutsu. A link to the song is in the description down below. 
thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.